Lecture 2. The Mystery of the Mind and the Soul The mind may be a terrible thing to waste, but it's also an extremely difficult thing to understand. The problems surrounding minds and their relation to brains are some of the most perplexing problems in all of metaphysics. Today, we are going to define these problems and talk about why the most common and supposed easiest answers to these questions fall short. But before we begin, to fully understand these problems, we have to keep a few things straight. First, the terms mind and brain are often used interchangeably. Someone might long for the day we discover the biological secrets to mind development when they're actually hoping to understand the development of the biological brain. Someone might say something makes their brain hurt when in fact they're mentally confused. This equivocation happens because of the known close relationship between the mind and brain. But in metaphysics, the word brain is reserved for the physical organ, made up of neurons, gray matter and white matter, axons and neurotransmitters and glands, that sits atop your spinal column. The word mind is reserved for what contains or is your mental life, your visual experiences, beliefs, decisions, personality, wants and desires and emotions. These are mental things and thus constitute your mind. One of the biggest questions in metaphysics is about the relationship between our minds and our brains. Philosophers call it the hard problem of consciousness. The question essentially is this, how does the activity of the brain produce mental phenomena? Now it's important to realize that this is not a question about how the brain works. For example, neuroscientists wonder how different parts of the brain function to process information. For example, neuroscientists wonder how different parts of the brain function to process information. How does two-dimensional visual information recorded by each eye get joined together in the brain to produce three-dimensional information about the world? Which part of the brain, the rational prefrontal cortex, or the emotional limbic system exerts the most influence over our actions? I'm not saying these things aren't important questions, but these are not the problems that metaphysicians are concerned about. They are not the hard problem of consciousness. The hard problem of consciousness is hard not because the other problems regarding how the brain works are easy, but because many philosophers think the hard problem is unsolvable. The problem is this. It seems clear that there is a direct relation between brain activity and mental activity. But what exactly is that relationship? More precisely, how is it that the activity of the brain can produce mental phenomena? Think about it this way. Although the brain also is composed of chemicals and glands, it is neurons that contain and process all the information. It is because the neurons are firing in a certain kind of way that you have, for example, a certain visual experience. But how do neurons produce mental experiences like visual experiences? And why does one collection of neurons firing a certain way produce a visual experience, but another set of neurons firing in a different way produce an auditory sensation, or a belief, or a desire? To grasp the problem, imagine a solved Rubik's Cube. Consider what you're looking at, the actual visual experience that you're having. A cube-shaped object with, say, red on one side, blue on one side, and white on the other. Think about that experience and what that experience is like. Now think about what happens in your brain and nervous system as you look at the cube. First, the photoreceptors in your eye react to the light reflected off the cube, and a signal is sent along your optic nerve to your brain. Then that information is received by your visual cortex. In the back of your brain were 30 or more different visual centers, each dedicated to a different aspect of vision, color, motion, etc. Process that information. It is then sent along two different visual pathways one dedicated to helping identify what the object is, and the other dedicated to figuring out where the object is, its size, how you can interact with it, etc. But think about the actual neurons that are encoding the information and firing away. None of them look like the cube or resemble your experience of the cube. Those neurons don't have cubic shape. Those neurons aren't red, white, or blue. They encode the visual information, sure, but they do not resemble your experience of the cube any more than the letters C, U, B, and E resemble the cube. 
So how exactly does a collection of neurons that are nothing like your experience of the cube create or give rise to a visual experience of the cube? That is the hard problem of consciousness. To explain the hard problem of consciousness, the philosopher Thomas Nagel pointed out that we will never know what it is like to be a bat. Bats navigate their surroundings by echolocation, sending out high-pitched shrieks and using how they echo back to gather information about, say, the location of a delicious bug. What kind of sensation does this information produce? Is it a visual sensation, like information light rays give us? Unlikely, since echolocation can't detect different frequencies of light. So what is it like to be a bat? We could study and even know everything there is to know about bat brains, yet it seems we would still not know what it is like to be a bat. The hard problem of consciousness is the problem of how brains produce the subjective sensation of what it is like to experience something. Some philosophers think the problem is unanswerable because, in the same way that we could know everything about bat brains, but not know what it is like to be a bat, we could study and come to know everything there is to know about human brains, but still not know the answer to the hard problem. The best we can do is find the neural correlates of conscious experience, the brain activity that goes along with them. But that will not answer the question of how that activity produces conscious experiences. Comedian Conan O'Brien once pointed towards this problem in a monologue joke. He mentioned a report where scientists said they can use brain scans to zero in to see what pain looks like in the brain. He then cuts away to a brain scan, they zoom in, and as they do, it turns into a clip from the horrible show Splash, where the overweight Louis Anderson throws himself off a high dive into a pool. Rather funny, also a bit inaccurate, uh, there is not really a pain center in the brain. But it also alludes to my point. You could know exactly what is going on in the brain while one feels pain. You could zoom in and see exactly what the neurons are doing, and even how they are wired to prevent the body from repeating whatever action is associated with the pain. But you would never actually see the experience of pain. Only the person whose brain you are studying really knows what the sensation feels like. You could probably learn how to prevent pain by studying what the brain does while a person is in pain, but it seems you can't study the experience of pain itself by studying the brain. Ultimately, mental experiences and brain events seem to be two totally different kinds of things. Brain events, the firing of neurons, have a location in time and space. Your beliefs and desires do not. Think about what your favorite dish smells like. Think about the aroma property that sensation has. Does any neuron in your brain have that property? It seems not. From these puzzles, a whole host of questions arise. The mind seems to be unlike anything in nature. So what is it? And what is its relationship to the brain? Could it be the same thing as the brain? If not, can the mind exist without the brain? When considering these questions for the first time, most people think that the soul hypothesis, the idea that humans have souls, holds the obvious and easy answer. But, and this is common in metaphysics, the obvious easy answer is inadequate. Fortunately, finding out why will send us down a path of discovery that leads to many more possible answers. But first, we have to understand what philosophers are talking about when they talk about the soul. They're not talking about someone's personality or their inner drive or emotions. The human soul, as it is classically conceived, is something non-physical. That is why it can have or at least contain things that have properties that no physical things can have. Your soul is where your visual experiences occur, your personality is housed, your beliefs are had, your emotions are felt. Basically, any mental activity that occurs, occurs in the soul. And since the soul is a non-physical entity, it is not reliant upon the body for existence. The soul can exist without the body. Consequently, the soul hypothesis is often coupled with the notion that our soul floats away from our bodies when we die. Some believe it becomes a ghost, others that it enters heaven. Basically, the idea is that your mind is a separable entity made of a non-physical substance containing all of your mentality. Now, it's important to realize that if the soul hypothesis turns out to be false, and the mind is not that kind of thing, 
that mental activity is not contained in a non-physical separable substance, that doesn't mean that minds don't exist. It just means that minds aren't the kind of thing the soul hypothesis suggests they are. And although most philosophers today doubt the existence of souls, very few philosophers today doubt the existence of minds. Initially, you might wonder why the existence of the soul even needs an argument. But while introspection does reveal the existence of one's mind, it seems that there is not anything that you can be more certain of than the fact that you're having experiences right now. Your introspection does not reveal that those experiences are housed in a non-physical substance that can float away from your brain when you die. Now, if you've heard of near-death experiences, or even had one yourself, you might think that there is good evidence for this. People who have near-death experiences supposedly come back with experiences and knowledge that they could only have if their soul floated away from their body while they were clinically dead. They saw a bright light at the end of the tunnel, they felt great peace, or even floated around the operating room and gained knowledge of what was going on while they were dead. The problem is, even if such stories are not exaggerated or confabulated, there are much more likely explanations for such experiences than the soul hypothesis. While your brain shuts down as you die, it releases chemicals that create a euphoric sensation. Its vision centers shut down in a way that creates tunnel vision, and activity in the angular gyrus even produces a floating sensation. You might wonder how someone can know what is going on in the operating room while they are clinically dead, but remember that the long beeps you hear in the operating room simply means the patient's heart has stopped beating, not that their brain has stopped functioning. They can still feel, remember, and even dream things. Even brain scanners like an EEG only monitor activity in the brain's outer cortex. The brain can remain active even after brain monitors go flat. Patients can even still hear things. Hearing, in fact, is the last sense to go. But the main reason most philosophers think the soul hypothesis fails to answer the questions about minds and brains is that it's doubtful that souls actually exist. There are reasons both philosophic and scientific to doubt the existence of souls. Let's examine each in turn. First, the philosophical arguments for the existence of the soul are poor. Although Plato presented arguments about the soul, the most famous arguments for the existence of the soul are given by the philosopher René Descartes. He essentially argues that the mind must be numerically distinct from the body and brain, literally a different object, and thus be made of a separate substance. In other words, he argues that what is called mind must actually be a soul. He presents three basic arguments. First, he suggests that one can doubt whether or not they possess a body, but one cannot doubt that they possess a mind. Since two objects cannot be one and the same thing, and yet possess different properties, in this case the property of doubtability, the mind and body must be separate things. He similarly argues that the body and mind must be different because one is divisible and the other is not. Lastly, he argues that since it is conceivable that the body exists while the mind doesn't, it must thus be logically possible for the mind to exist without the body, and if that is logically possible, they must be distinct entities. Each of these arguments, however, fails. First, it doesn't seem that doubtability is the kind of property that can delineate objects or substances. For example, does Lois Lane doubt that Superman is a genuine hero? Of course not. Does she doubt that Clark Kent is? Of course she does. But that does not mean that Clark Kent and Superman are two separate individuals. Indeed, they are the same person. Lois Lane can doubt the heroic status of one but not the other because she is ignorant about their true nature. The same may be true about Descartes. He can only doubt the body but not the mind because he does not understand their true nature. If, for example, minds can exist without brains, then you can't doubt one without doubting the other. Something similar could be said about Descartes' argument from conceivability. That he can conceive of the mind existing without the body doesn't mean that it is possible. It may be that Descartes can only conceive of that because he is ignorant of the true nature of minds and bodies. I can conceive of the morning star existing without the evening star also existing, but that doesn't mean that they're separate things. They're not, by the way, they're both the planet Venus. The same is true for the argument from divisibility. Divisibility doesn't seem to be the kind of property that can delineate objects or substances, and Descartes' ignorance may allow him to think that one is divisible when the other is not. 
But further, as we discovered last lecture, we have learned that minds, in fact, are divisible. The split brain patients we discussed in the first lecture prove this. Of course, the fact that there are no good arguments for the existence of the soul doesn't 100% disprove the soul's existence, but their failure is still a major hurdle for soul belief. When it comes to existential matters, matters regarding whether or not something exists, the burden to provide evidence and arguments is on the believer. If you want to believe that a tiny teapot orbits the sun along with the planets, the burden is on you to provide the evidence. And until there is evidence, the rest of us are justified in doubting its existence, and you can't be justified in believing. Sure, it may be so small that you can never prove that it wasn't there, but that is no reason to believe that it is. The same is true for souls. Without evidence or a good argument, skepticism is the rational position. Further, there are convincing philosophical arguments against the existence of the soul. Consider this problem. Suppose souls exist, and that your soul decides to move your arm. Why does this cause your arm to move and not, say, the person sitting next to you? Sure, the decision was made by your soul, but in virtue of what is that soul yours? In virtue of what is that soul connected to your body? It can't be because it's closer to it. Souls are non-physical and thus have no location in time or space. And even if we ignore that and say that somehow your soul is closer to your body, it's still unclear how something that is non-physical like your soul can move something that is physical like your brain or body. After all, you can be sitting in your car, but unless the car is gassed up and the engine is working and the key is in the ignition and you know how to drive, that car is not going anywhere. The soul hypothesis is supposed to explain human behavior. But without a satisfactory account of soul-body interaction, this explanation just raises more questions than it answers. And you can't get around those problems by saying, it just does, or because it's mine. That doesn't explain anything. We want to know how it does and why it's yours. The problem of interaction has plagued dualists since at least Descartes' time and has yet to receive a satisfactory answer. In addition, even if we ignore this problem, the very concept of physical-non-physical -physical interaction raises other serious problems. A non-physical entity like the soul reaching out and causing things in the physical world would violate three fundamental and well-established physical laws. The first is the law of conservation of energy, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. If our souls were reaching out from beyond the physical world and causing things like our arms to move, they would actually be adding energy to the environment. In fact, if this were the case, the constant influx of new energy would cause the Earth to continually get hotter and hotter. And although the evidence for global warming is convincing, I'm pretty sure that scientists agree that our bodily movements violating energy conservation is not the cause. The second is the law of conservation of momentum, which states that the total momentum of any system always remains constant. If our souls are moving our bodies, the amount of momentum of the system in which they live would not be constant, but continually growing. Lastly, the soul hypothesis violates the causal closure of the physical, which says that physical events can only have physical causes. This has been confirmed by the fact that any time we have gone looking for the cause of physical events, it has turned out to be another physical event. And this includes explanations for our bodily movements, which trace back to neuronal activity in our brains. These problems constitute what we might call the problem of downward causation and it is a significant objection to the soul hypothesis. It also brings us to our next topic, the scientific reasons to doubt the existence of the soul. An initial understanding of these reasons is probably best understood via a retelling of a true clinical tale, the case of Phineas Gage, a railroad foreman from the 1800s. In those days, they used explosives to drive railway stakes into the ground. An unfortunate mis-explosion caused a tamping iron to shoot up, and travel through Gage's skull, entering the bottom left of his chin and exiting the top of his head, pulverizing a portion of his forebrain. Now, Gage survived, but his personality was completely changed. Where before he had been a very genteel man and a respectable and responsible worker, after the accident, he became a brute. He was rude and aggressive and completely irresponsible, indecisive and careless. He would abandon plans and goals almost before he made them, making him unable to keep his position as a foreman. He swore like a sailor, and women were encouraged not to be left alone with him as he would attempt to molest them. It seemed clear that the accident had completely changed his personality. 
This challenged the soul hypothesis because it was assumed that personality was one of the main things that the soul housed and was responsible for. If the soul, a non-physical entity, housed personality, physical changes to one's brain could not affect it. Yet such changes had significantly and undeniably altered Gage's personality. The obvious conclusion was that the part of Gage's forebrain that was demolished was responsible for his previous genteel personality. Thus, personality was pulled from the non-physical world of the soul into the physical world of the brain. Some have since claimed that Gage's personality change was exaggerated in the case reports, but the point is now moot. Gage's case sent us down the path of discovery, and we have now found where nearly all of our mental functions are performed in the brain, often because of cases like Gage's, where specific brain injuries made people lose specific mental functions. A case made famous by Oliver Sacks, called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, helped teach us where facial recognition occurs in the brain. Another patient, made famous by Dr. V.S. Ramachandran, who thought his parents were imposters, taught us about connections between the emotional systems and facial recognition. Stroke patients who deny their paralysis, their left side is paralyzed but they insist that it's not, and they'll even hallucinate movement in their immobile limbs, have taught us about the roles of the brain's two hemispheres in producing one's beliefs and worldview. Although not everything about how the brain works is fully understood, it is now undeniable that all mental activity is a result directly of brain activity. Everything that was once explained by the soul, emotions, language, decisions, sensation, memories, personality, are all now explained by the activity of the brain. Activity, for example, in the limbic system, Broca and Wernicke's areas, our prefrontal cortex, and the Pinfield map. There is nothing left for the classical soul to do, and thus no reason to suppose that it exists. This brings us to a common reply to such objections that exposes a severe deficiency in the soul hypothesis. Defenders of the soul hypothesis will often claim that finding the neural correlates of mental activity does not mean that the soul doesn't exist, because it could be that the soul controls the body by manipulating the corresponding brain areas, and that's why they are correlated with mental activity. To understand the error of this argument, consider an example from the history of science. To explain heat, some scientists used to hypothesize the existence of a substance known as phlogiston. They supposed that phlogiston was a material given off by such things as fire and absorbed by such things as iron rods. However, it was then observed that objects most often don't gain mass when they're heated or burned. To defend their theory, phlogiston believers suggested that, unlike all other materials, phlogiston has no mass. Then it was further observed that sometimes burned materials weigh less than they originally did. So they hypothesized that sometimes phlogiston has negative mass. At this point, they were already seeming desperate. Special exceptions to save your hypothesis are not exactly considered sound reasoning. Sometimes it's okay. For example, Newton's laws of motion were a highly confirmed scientific theory. When they didn't always correctly predict Uranus's location, we didn't throw them out. Instead, we hypothesized that a yet-to-be-discovered planet, an observable thing, was throwing it off. And when we looked, lo and behold, there was Neptune. That's good scientific reasoning. But if your theory has already got things wrong and it's hanging by a thread, you can't hypothesize the existence of unobservable, untestable phenomena just to save it. And if that wasn't bad enough, when we learn that heat can be fully accounted for simply by the increased momentum of the molecules or atoms of a heated object, the phlogiston defenders became even more desperate. To save their theory, they insisted that making molecules move faster just is how phlogiston heats objects up. Hopefully the lesson is clear. There is no reason to suppose the existence of an extra substance to explain something when there is already a perfectly good explanation found in what we already know exists, like particles and their motion. The same is true for the soul. There is no reason to suppose the existence of an extra substance to explain the behavior of our bodies when there is already a perfectly good explanation within what we already know exists, the brain and its neural activity. To do so is clearly and simply a desperate attempt to save the soul hypothesis from the evidence. The implication that souls don't exist might seem troublesome to some listeners. Often people think that if souls don't exist, then there is no God, all religion is false, we have no free will, there's no afterlife. 
but none of this actually follows. I could go on in great detail about this, but since it's not really a metaphysical matter, I'll only touch upon it briefly in conclusion. First of all, souls have nothing to do with God's existence. God can exist while souls don't. Souls can exist while God doesn't. There's no real relationship between the two. It is true that soul talk is in some religious talk, but since God could exist while souls do not, the non-existence of the soul is basically irrelevant to God's existence. Second of all, soul belief is not as ubiquitous among religions as one might expect. The Hindu concept of Atman, sometimes translated as soul, is completely different than the classical concept of soul that we've been considering. And Buddhists don't even believe in selves, much less souls. The Buddha himself proclaimed, only through ignorance and delusion do men indulge in the dream that their souls are separate and self-existing entities. The ancient Jews did not believe in the existence of souls either. Only ruach, often translated as spirit, but only means the breath of life. And according to the 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia, the belief that the soul continues its existence after the dissolution of the body is a matter of philosophical or theological speculation rather than of simple faith and is nowhere expressly taught in Holy Scripture. The early Christians didn't believe in the existence of souls either, and biblical scholars agree that the concept is absent from Scripture. It teaches the Jewish conception of the person and expects the afterlife to be brought about by the physical resurrection of the dead. The early Christian apologist Justin Martyr even told his friend Trypho, if you have fallen in with some who are called Christians, but who say that their souls when they die are taken to heaven, do not imagine that they are Christians. It wasn't until early Christian scholars like Augustine and Origen imported the idea of the soul into their Christian doctrines after studying Plato that Christians even began to take the soul hypothesis seriously. The idea became a part of mainstream Christian belief around the start of the 5th century. Because of the now well-known objections to soul belief, many modern Christian academics want to abandon the idea of the soul and return to the early Christian and biblical concept of persons. The existence of the soul also does not mean that there is not an afterlife. Even if your soul doesn't float away from your body when you die, God could still resurrect you or recreate you or even steal your brain and replace it with a dead replica as you die. We will talk about the legitimacy of such proposals as a way for God to facilitate the afterlife later on in the course. The non-existence of the soul might threaten free will, but as we will also see later, it is not the only thing that threatens free will. And truth be told, if the difficulties we discuss later can be overcome, the non-existence of the soul can't really be any threat. All the non-existence of the soul entails is that a specific view of what persons are is false. I have not considered any of the ways that someone might redefine the concept of soul in order to still be able to say or use the words souls exist. But redefining the word won't save the classic conception that we have been talking about here. The way people usually redefine it equates souls with minds. For example, some people think evidence that animals have emotions or feel pain is evidence that they quote unquote have souls. But remember, no souls does not equal no minds. Recall, most philosophers believe that minds exist, they just don't think they are housed in a separable substance. Minds exist, they're just reliant upon the brain for existence. The fact that animals seem to have emotions is evidence that they have minds, but not that they have souls. Regardless, it was merely my aim to demonstrate to you that the easy answer to the metaphysical question of the mind, that souls exist, is a very problematic answer, and thus that it is certainly worth considering other possible theories. We will turn to the first of such theories next lecture, the theory that the mind and brain are identical.